Welcome to Footnoting History. This is Ryan, and today we will discuss the Southern Invasion of Missouri by Confederate General Sterling Price and the defiant defense of Lexington by Colonel James Mulligan, and how he thumbed his nose at the invading rebels in a manner that made him a national hero. In December of 1944, Hitler's Nazi forces in the West launched a last-ditch assault through the Ardennes, a thrust designed to reach Antwerp, capture a major Allied port, and prevent the Allies from reaching the German homeland. The Ardennes was defended by two American divisions and bore the brunt of a German assault launched by three armies, more than 250,000 troops, in what some historians have called the deadliest and most desperate battle of the war in the West. For Hitler's men, who had been pushed back from the beaches of Normandy and through France, this was the final push of the war, one designed to knock the Allies back to the coast and perhaps out of the war long enough to allow Germany to concentrate their efforts on the surging Soviet forces to their east. Though the German forces achieved early victory, the Allies, under command of Dwight D. Eisenhower, rushed forward to meet the Blitzkrieg head-on. At the crucial road juncture of Bastogne, American forces led by the 101st Airborne made a heroic stand. Arriving in the city on the 19th of December, the 101st moved into position on the outskirts of town just as the Germans were pushing forward. The standing order given to General Anthony McAuthy on the morning of the 19th was simply to hold Bastogne, but hard fighting on the night of the 19th and the morning of the 20th meant that by the 22nd the situation had become desperate. Bad weather prevented an airdrop of much needed ammunition and the loss of the division's medical company on the night of the 19th meant that wounded soldiers lay suffering without attention or supplies. Around noon on the 22nd of December, four Germans arrived in the American lines under a white flag of truce and announced they sought the surrender of the town. Given the terms of surrender, McAuphy replied simply to the German commander, nuts, the American commander. The German officer, not understanding the correspondence, asked, is this reply a negative or affirmative? To which he was told, the reply is decidedly not affirmative. He was told simply it meant you can go to hell. His response became synonymous with American spirit and dedication on the battlefield. Outgunned and against all odds, American soldiers will never surrender when given the order to hold the line. But McAuthy was not the first American to utter such words in the face of an overwhelming foe. That honor goes to James Mulligan, who gave a similar response to the rebel army that invaded Missouri some 90 years before. In November of 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States. The one-term congressman from Springfield, Illinois, had made a name for himself two years before during a series of debates with the little giant, Stephen Douglas, in a contest for the Senate seat of the state of Illinois. Although he lost the contest, he emerged as the country's leading Republican and eventually secured his party's nomination for president in the 1860 election. When the Democrats split their ticket over the issue of slavery, they virtually ensured Lincoln's victory which was a landslide in the Electoral College, though much closer in the public vote. South Carolina ceded from the Union soon thereafter, followed by Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and Texas, forming a new nation, the Confederate States of America. Tensions escalated over the winter, eventually boiling over into armed conflict in April of 1861, when Confederate forces opened fire on the federal position at Fort Sumner in Charleston Harbor. When Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion in the South, Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee also seceded, and the war began in earnest. Throughout the North, men flocked to enlist. Illinois, Lincoln's home state, was alive with excitement as young men eagerly signed muster rolls and hoped for the opportunity to meet the Southern traders on the field of battle. Amongst the patriotic hue and cry of the early weeks of the war emerged a vocal and dedicated constituency, the adopted Irish citizens of that state. Before the war, many had questioned whether the Irish were suited for citizenship in America. Nativists, xenophobes who sought to reinforce a white Anglo-Protestant version of the United States, were very concerned when hundreds of thousands of Irish Catholics arrived on America's shores during the 1840s. Fleeing the potato famine, these men and women arrived desperately poor, and their Catholicism, allegiance to the Pope in Rome, and cultural proclivities, including their enjoyment of alcohol and blind loyalty to the Democratic Party, was cause for concern among some circles in American society. Styled by some as voting cattle, there were serious concerns in the spring and summer of 1861 as to the loyalty of these adopted citizens to the Union. Yet the Irish and Irish Americans in Illinois responded to war with a vigor and enthusiasm that surprised many observers. In Rockfield, Illinois, for example, a war meeting was, quote, largely attended and editors noted that the sons of the Green Isle are not wanting in their patriotism. 
and that they appreciated the untold blessings of America. In another meeting, the Irish speakers called for volunteers to rescue the flag of the Union. Liberty must not die, they cried. The patriotic rhetoric that emerged among Irish American communities in the weeks after the attack on Fort Sumner was met with popular response as Irishmen surged forward to enlist to defend the Union and the Republican experiment. James A. Mulligan was a natural choice to lead the organization of an Irish regiment in Illinois. Born in New York to Irish parents, Mulligan practiced law in Chicago during the years before the war and, like most Irish and Irish Americans during this time, was a Democrat. In the decade leading up to the conflict, he slowly worked his way upward in both the social and political circles of Chicago and became increasingly intertwined with local and state affairs as a lawyer and editor of the Catholic newspaper, The Western Tablet. In 1857, he lived in Washington, D.C. and was a clerk at the Department of the Interior and then returned to Chicago, where he became an increasingly prominent member of the Irish American community. He was nominated to lead a number of Irish committees and also served as a lieutenant in the Shields Guard, a unit that was openly affiliated with the Irish nationalist movement, the Fenians. When war broke out, Mulligan was an excellent choice for Governor Yates, a Republican, to select for a political commission simultaneously consolidating control over the state and creating a strong alliance between political opponents. Almost immediately after war was declared, Mulligan began to conceptualize his small militia unit, the, Seal the Shields Guards, as a nucleus for a larger ethnic brigade. He was supported by a group of Irish Americans who met for the first time two weeks after Fort Sumner fell. This committee organized with the sole purpose of raising funds to organize an Irish regiment and support the families of those volunteering for war. On April 25th, Mulligan traveled to Springfield, Illinois, where he petitioned the government to accept his brigade into service. He stayed in that city for two weeks, but by May it was clear that these petitions fell on deaf ears. Supported by the men back in Chicago, Mulligan was sent money, with which he bought a ticket to Washington, D.C., and arrived at the Capitol with a letter of introduction to Vice President Hannibal Hamlin in the hopes of securing federal authorization for the organization of his regiment. He was successful. When federal recruiters arrived in Chicago in June of 1861 to muster volunteers from Illinois into service, their first trip was to a brewery on West Polk Street where Mulligan had established a camp for his Irish Brigade. There, several companies of stalwart fellows who only needed uniforms to give them an excellent appearance as soldiers were put through their facings and formed in lines as visitors passed down. Their uniforms, quote, a gray shirt and gray pantaloons trimmed with green cord, a blue jacket with a green collar and blue army regulation cap would be a fitting tribute for these Irish volunteers. On June 16th, five days before the armies in the East clashed for the first time in Northern Virginia at Bull Run, Mulligan and his men, the gallant Irish brigade, left Quincy, Illinois, anxious for a clash with the rebels. Having boarded trains in Chicago the night before, the 23rd was en route to Jefferson City, Missouri via St. Louis, where it was tasked with protecting the loyal government then in session at that city. Lincoln had placed considerable emphasis on the continued federal control of the border states due to the potential assistance, economic, political, and in terms of manpower that these states could have provided to the Confederacy. Control of Missouri remained very much in balance throughout the war, but never was so much so as during the spring and summer of 1861, when Confederates launched their only successful military campaign into the state under the command of General Sterling Price. After the Union defeat at Bull Run, Lincoln appointed John C. Fremont, an 11-year Army veteran and 1856 Republican presidential candidate, commander of the Western Department, with hopes that his leadership would tip the balance in the West in favor of the Union. Despite an increased federal presence in that area, by the end of July, Missouri's fate was still very much in question. Union forces under Nathaniel Lyon did succeed in pushing Sterling Price's Confederates back to the southwest corner of the state, but success came at the expense of a tenuous 200-mile-long supply line that stretched from St. Louis to Springfield. This would become the focus of Sterling Price's renewed campaign in the fall. As Mulligan and his regiment moved southwest from Chicago, they became part of a Union campaign marked by ineptitude and lack of coherent strategy that eventually culminated in the trenches outside of Lexington, Missouri. The 13,000 Missouri militia and Confederate troops under Price posed a considerable threat to Lyons, whose 5,000 troops were nearing the end of their 90 days enlistment terms. Simultaneously, Confederate feints in the southeastern portion of the state threatened Cairo, Illinois, the major base of Union operations on the Mississippi, 
and forced northern attention away from Price's troops and bled much needed reinforcements away from Lyons. Recognizing the immediate threat posed by Price's army, the federal command moved to intercept and on August 10, 1861, the two forces met at Wilson's Creek, 10 miles south of the town of Springfield, Missouri. Despite being outnumbered nearly two to one, federal forces achieved some degree of success early in the battle. Dividing their forces in two, General Fran Siegel in command of six cannon and two regiment marched 15 miles around the southern portion of Price's force on the evening of August 9th. At eight the next morning, Lyons, with the larger body of the Union Army, advanced on the Confederate lines. The commencement of artillery fire to the north signaled Siegel's attack on the Confederate rear, and though well coordinated, the joint Federal assaults met stiff resistance from their foe. The battle, one newspaper noted, raged with a fierceness seldom ever equaled for over three hours before General Lyons was killed by Confederate fire. The smoke hung like a storm cloud over the valley, the Boston Advertiser reported, a fit emblem of mourning for the departed hero. Fighting continued for two more hours when low on ammunition, the Union forces were forced to withdraw from the field. Union and Confederate armies each suffered approximately 1,300 casualties, and the Federal retreat opened the western portion of Missouri to Price's invasion. Buoyed by victory, Price moved north towards Lexington. Concerned about the safety of that city, Fremont ordered Mulligan from Jefferson City and the march, which covered over 150 miles, took the Irish regiment nine days, and they arrived in Lexington on September 9th, only days before Price's forces would converge. Newspapers throughout the nation watched the events unfolding in Missouri with much anticipation. On September 14th, for example, newspapers in the East reported with concern that Price and the rebels were within 40 miles of Lexington with 15,000 troops and 18 pieces of artillery. In Philadelphia, headlines reported with concern the rapid advance of the rebels. On September 17th, news began to filter in from the west that Price had attacked the city, and those in the east eagerly awaited news of its fate. Though confident that Price would be cut off from the rear, nevertheless, the siege of the city in the wake of the Union defeat at Bull Run was of considerable concern throughout the north. As Price advanced too, public confidence in Fremont's ability rapidly deteriorated. On September 20th, Reports from Lexington verified that Mulligan, though vastly outnumbered, had withstood Price's initial assault on the defenses. The New York Times reported that Price, desirous of achieving an easy victory, sent Colonel Mulligan a formal summons to surrender, but received a defiance couched in terms more forceful than elegant. It was reported that Mulligan's reply was, like McAuliffe's, go to hell. The Irishmen had concentrated their lines along a bluff outside of town. The works were of earth seven feet high and 12 feet thick with a ditch six feet deep and 12 feet broad surrounding them. Another smaller work was erected inside defended by a ditch, the whole capable of holding 10,000 troops. According to initial reports, Price had lost nearly 100 men and from more than two to 400 wounding during the initial assault on the federal position. Union losses had been five killed and several wounded. It was, one noted, a brave defense by Colonel Mulligan on the evening of September 23rd, however, reports of the Irish Brigade's heroics were countered by disturbing news of Mulligan's surrender. The New York Tribune reported early that day that the national flag still hung over the city, but that news was later refuted in the evening that Mulligan had finally conceded to Price's overwhelming force. The Daily Tribune noted, with some degree of sadness, that Mulligan was compelled at last to yield to a superior number after four days of hard fighting. At the time of the surrender, the troops in Lexington had been without water for two days, and there was little hope of relief. In fact, Mulligan had surrendered the city three days earlier, in what would mark the second major defeat by Union forces early in the war. Despite his surrender of the city, Mulligan became wildly famous in the wake of the battle, in part because of his defiance of Price. A brief biography of the 32-year-old brave defender of Lexington provides some insight into this acclaim. Colonel Mulligan, the biography noted, is worthy of all praise. A purer, a better man does not live in the state of Illinois. Six feet, three inches in height with a wiry elastic frame, a large, lustrous, hazel-eyed, an open, frank, Celtic face stamped with courage, pluck, and independence. Mulligan, another report noted, was honorable in all relations, respected by all. A promising lawyer when the war broke out. Now he is. Long may he continue so one of the brave defenders of the Union. 
Mulligan, the article concluded in one of his last correspondences before his surrender, wrote that, quote, if I die, if I fall in the defense of our laws and our constitution, let my example be followed by all, by every brave man who loved the fame and renown of their fathers and who made us a great and honored people. Mulligan's response that Sterling Price should go to hell when asked for his surrender propelled him into the national limelight. The editor of a Wisconsin newspaper applauded the move, bluntly noting, quote, we admire his curtain daring answer. A saucy, rough, pointed, earnest, and unmannerly as it is, it speaks volumes of the colonel's commitment to the national cause. Another account of the battle had Mulligan leading a charge against the rebels who were scattered like a flock of sheep and found the colonel in the aftermath uninjured save a buckshot through the leg and a coat riddled with bullet holes where six or seven balls and bucks had passed through the green blouse he wore. In another account, Mulligan, wounded, would not give up his sword until taken from him by the main force. The Irish Brigade, another newspaper applauded, fought for 59 hours without water and had only two barrels of vinegar to quench their thirst all that time. Their surrender came only after Mulligan was compelled to yield to a force more terrible than the 27,000 rebels that surrounded him, that of thirst. The Irish stand at Lexington was proof to many that these men who used to civilly be styled voting cattle have covered themselves with glory in the cause of the Union. Mulligan's Irish Brigade justifies the reputation which their native countrymen had won in every civilized nation for loyalty and higher military courage. The naturalized citizens of this country, they concluded, have been as patriotic and self-sacrificing in this war as the native born. This reaction is important and shows the broader appeal that such defiance has among the American public. Ninety years before McAuliffe snubbed his nose at the Nazis, another American, James Mulligan, gave a similar gesture to the rebels who had violated the sanctity of the Union. Though Mulligan eventually yielded to overwhelming forces and surrendered his city, his response was nevertheless received with the same degree of enthusiasm as his counterpart and solidified his reputation as an American hero. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.